Welcome to the Wheeler Centre and Relative State Series. I'm Alicia Sometimes and we're in for a big treat. We have two hardcore Carlton fans. <laughs> and two, uh, <laughs> We have to give them our love. And two of the most respected sports journalists uh, going around at the moment. Uh, we have the wonderful Samantha Lane, and uh, she specialises in AFL Olympic and cycling. Samantha joined Channel 7's AFL broadcast team in 2013 after 10 seasons with Channel 10's AFL panel show before the game. Now part of uh, the Saturday night AFL coverage on the Seven Network, Sam delivers news, views and in-field interviews. Uh, on-field interviews. Uh, Sam is a two-time Quill Award winner from the Melbourne Press Club. In 2010, she won the prize for the best sports story of the year. Uh, Sam's work on the AFL and NRL doping scandals in a team entry with Nick McKenzie, Richard Baker, Caroline Wilson and Jack Nile won the Walkley Award in 2013. And in 2012, Sam was made Olympics reporter for The Age um, and covered the 2008-2012 Olympics, which is such an impressive record. So a big round of applause for Sam. <laughs> And uh, we love the word veteran and legend <laughs> thing <laughs> thrown around. How easy can you we just, do? You just wait. You won't always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. Won't always be a spring chicken. Tim Lane has been broadcasting and writing for sport more than 40 years. An award-winning sports journalist. He spent three decades with the ABC covering football and international cricket and worked at five Olympic Games. Today, he writes a weekly column for the Sunday Age and continues to broadcast AFL games games and cricket on 3AW. Big round of applause for Tim. <laughs> now, let's start at the beginning of your life. Well, uh, you as a youngster, you grew up in Launceston and uh, you weren't always destined to be a sports journalist. You studied science. I did, <laughs> um, but sport was my, was my real love back then. It was... Uh, I guess the one thing that captivated me, I, I um, was a competent student through school and in those times, in the 1960s, um, there was a trend, I think, that um, generally competent students were, were directed towards the sciences, particularly uh, male students. So I found myself uh, studying chemistry, physics and maths um, in the last couple of years at school and, and I went to uni and it was logical that I did those. Um, logical in the sense that I signed on to do them but uh, not in any other way because I, 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 my mind hadn't developed to a point where I had any natural curiosity about what I was studying and really if you're going to study the sciences uh, in a worthwhile way, that's what you, you need to have. And so I was going along and simply treating them as academic <coughs> subjects uh, that um, set exams for students at the end of the year that you tried to pass. And uh, without an interest in them at uni, uh, it was a lost cause from a long way out, really. I spent three years floundering and uh, passed a few subjects along the way, but uh, eventually the the uh, failures were outnumbering <laughs> the successes and, uh, and the money was drying up and so it all came to a screeching halt and uh, I, I then spent a year working as a, a labourer in an edgel pea cannery outside Devonport where my family now lived and um, during that year, I, in, in March actually, it was on the, I can pinpoint it to the day, the Monday of the long weekend in March, I got into a boozy conversation with a bloke in a local pub and he happened to be the small town radio station football commentator. He was a <laughs> bit of a local legend. And out of that, I started going along and broadcasting football matches with him. That was 1972. Wow. So there's a lesson for you out there. Boozy conversations in pubs can lead somewhere. So yeah. when, did you, when, when did you know that uh, broadcasting, especially about sports, had you hooked? There was a, a moment uh, before this event occurred in my last year at uni and I was sitting in the common room at the residential college at which I lived, playing cards, talking sport 
and there was a guy who lived in the college who was quite a bit older than most of the rest of us. He was a, a tutor. I think he was, was studying or, or had done a PhD. Um, but, a, you know, a, a, a guy with an interest in sport and a broad, much more mature person than I was at that time. And he heard me rabbiting on about what was going on in the world of football or cricket or whatever. And, uh, and I remember he stopped this day and he said to me in quite a heartfelt way, have you ever thought about um, working as a sports journalist? I mean, he, I think, he could see that I was, I was floundering with what I was doing. And it was just a brief moment, but it opened my mind, I guess, to the possibility that such jobs existed. I'd thought totally in a straight line up until then. I'd just grown up thinking, well, you, you went to uni and you, you tried to pass, and if you didn't, well, you know, hopefully there was a parachute that uh, brought you down gradually in some way. Um, I, I bumped into him many years later at Tullamarine Airport and, uh, and I was able to remind him of that conversation and what a, a, as brief as it was, uh, what a significant moment it was in my life. And um, we've, he lives in Western Australia and we see each other every now and then. And it's such a nice thing actually to think that this was a person who was aware enough to just, you know, in that very brief moment impact on someone's life. And Sam, obviously it was in your DNA that, uh, that sports would be on and around your house. You had your dad uh, covering the games on a weekend and going away for weeks at a time with cricket. And, but when did you realise that uh, sports, you know, was, was a passion for you? Well, <clears throat> it, it's a very different story to dad's, I think. Um, and maybe that says something just about gender from, from the beginning. Mm. But um, I guess by way of background, um, mum and dad only lived together till I was four so I can't really remember um, dad so much at, at that point but I guess my first consciousness of dad and sport was that it meant he was away so um, I you know at four you don't have a I don't think I knew I liked anything really um, but but um, I guess as I grow, grew older I knew that on the weekends dad was at the footy and in the summer dad was at the cricket and um, actually for that reason, I didn't like sport at all because it meant when, you know, it was the weekend and I wanted to see my dad, I didn't. Um, and then for weeks on end um, during summer, um, he was off on these big tours of cricket. Um, <clears throat> and so mum and dad thankfully had a really good adult friendship. Um, but everything um, changed for me um, and for dad um, when mum passed away when I was 10 and I moved in um, with three cats which we may talk about later um, <laughs> and how they've impacted on dad's broadcasting over the years <laughs> um, and you have to excuse my cold by the way these tissues are here not for tears but just because <laughs> I've got a really bad head cold um, and so I moved in with dad when I was 10 um, only child um, move in with this um, man who I know clearly as my dad but only know him um, as having spent maybe one night a week with dad when I'd stay um, over um, and give mum a little break every week. Um, but I think then, and I can only kind of intellectualise this mm. as an adult, um, I think that even as a young girl I realised that if we were going to really bond mm. I needed to work out what this thing was that had a hold on dad and that was sport so you know it it obsessed him um, every morning newspaper radio the soundtrack of my life is you know sport um, and when he was calling it I also had it on because it made me quite seriously feel like he was mm. still there he mm. was in the room um, so I connected to sport, one, I think, as a means to find something in common, apart from the cats, um, which Dad did come to like, um, but, um, but also as a, as a means of um, staying in touch when he was away. And, and then I guess um, I wouldn't have 
been at the age for 10 years as I clock up this year, quite disturbingly, but um, um, I wouldn't have done it if it, if it, you know, it didn't have more grip than that. Um, what evolved for me, I guess, in, in um, discovering sport, being interested in sport and eventually covering it myself was um, this thing about sport that, um, one, gets people together in a way that I just found as a young person mind-blowing, you know, going to the footy with Dad when he couldn't find someone to look after me. What I loved first was being in a crowd, mm. sitting in a group of people um, at the footy and sort of feeling part of a family. Um, and then I started taking notice of the actual sport and then, you know, found something that I loved, which was the Carlton Footy Club and really becoming involved in, in following a team, which I, I loved. Um, and now, I suppose, as, as a journalist, what I love about sport as well is this um, one opportunity to tell people's stories and hear from people that we revere um, and, and hear them tell their stories um, and be able to kind of help them trans transmit it sometimes. Um, but the power that sport has um, to engage people on issues that I think are really important. So whether that's, <clears throat> you know, racism, something political as well, um, gender politics, whatever, um, mm. fair pay, um, that kind of stuff I think we can converse about through sport and I really, really like that and remain drawn um, to it. But it's it's not from the position of a man who, you know, grew up playing footy and probably was frustrated that mm. he wasn't going to be able to pursue an elite playing career. Um, yeah, we come at it at quite different spots I guess. I think that's a very familiar story for maybe for many you, of you out there too where you connect uh, with a parent through sport. I remember the, my dad's radio being on, he was a St Kilda tragic and just that you know you had to get into their life in some way so yeah, that's fascinating and so I'm just interested uh, from a professional point of view who are your uh, sports journalist idols or y either of you or just who did you look up to in that field at your time what who was who was the best mm, well it's I suppose my view of it's changed a lot as mm. time has gone by and listening to Sam I was realizing how much um, my I suppose my, my interest in sport and my focus on what happens has has changed through the years and 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 that the reason is that uh, the sport itself is has become a medium for expression for me in my life and it's probably what it always was in a sense but sport was the thing that I could relate to when I was young which gave me a sense of um, connection in a way that prompted me to um, when the opportunity to form a career in that area emerged it was just the logical thing to do um, because here was something that that I loved I, I you know I spent a lot of time talking about it and thinking about it and reading about it and and so on and um, so to be able to work in the area to be able to actually make a living doing something that you know I, I felt connected to and enjoyed was just the most logical thing uh, back in those days I guess the people who I whose work I liked and admired were were broadcasters whose sound I enjoyed, who made sport sound like an exciting thing, who, who, who seemed to project the sense of connection to and passion for uh, football matches and cricket matches, uh, but who were also aesthetically pleasing in some way. I mean, we, I, I didn't think about it in that way, but um, it was part of what I liked. I loved Alan McGilvray broadcasting the cricket on the ABC because he had a beautiful voice that connected with the the product, which was the cricket. Uh, and I've often said that, uh, and you know, I don't think this is just the, the misty-eyed view of one from that time, a long time ago, but um, I don't think I've ever heard anybody, any sports broadcaster anywhere in the world, really, who's captured the sound of his or her sport, the way in which McGilvray did with cricket. There was just that beautiful, flowing, summer, Saturday afternoon feel to it across a green ground, you know, that, um, that caught 
the essence mm. of, of cricket. Um, there were others in, in football, but as I say, they've, they've, it's changed as the years have gone by and I probably these days um, like um, elements of people's work that mightn't have captured me back then. I probably look for journalistic um, excellence, uh, but also forms of expression which, um, you know, I wouldn't have even noticed at, a, at an earlier time. I do remember as a, as a teenager when I'd started um, listen, listening to Carlton's matches from Tasmania and I'd become a Carlton tragic. I was in my teens and um, we lived in Devonport and you could pick up Melbourne radio stations uh, across Bass Strait um, well enough for me to be able to hear the games and so sometimes rather than going to the local football I would listen and uh, and I do remember stumbling upon Norman Banks and Doug Hayward calling matches on 3AW in the mid 60s and it was like nothing else it was flowery and and um, <laughs> it, it, it sort of had an adjectival quality <laughs> the like of which I'd never heard previously and at first I didn't <laughs> go much on it but then Carlton must have won on the first week and I, I got to like these guys. <laughs> <laughs> but I, it, it, it does live in the memory that, yeah. um, you know, he was, he was Norman Banks, who was much loved uh, in Melbourne from what I've read and I, my awareness of him was only calling the occasional football, only hearing him call the occasional football match. But um, I can see why people might have liked him. He was that old style, grand uh, broadcaster, uh, almost our equivalent to the English cricket commentators of the time, the John Arlott's and Brian Johnston's. And it must be a very different environment for you. Who, were, there, were there any female Definitely, yeah. So when I was describing that, um, you know, moving in with dad time and the paper kind of being delivered every day and I can visualise dad sort of holding up the broadsheet, um, you know, standing in the kitchen, making lunch, doing breakfast, <laughs> juggling a few things and, and holding up the broadsheet and I... I probably made this up, but I'm sure that, you know, most mornings when he was really transfixed on a story, um, it tended to have the byline Caroline Wilson on it. Mm -hmm. And um, and at that time, um, a, a woman called Penny Crisp still wrote for The Age and um, I became more connected to footy by reading these two women. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I guess if I were to dissect what it was that they did that you know, other journalists didn't um, do for me at that time, they brought me into a story as one, a 10-year-old girl, um, and two, someone that didn't really know much detail about sport at all. So these women, um, one, got my attention and two, educated me. And I think the way that they did that and the way particularly that they got me in, was by um, bringing me a human story, but a really interesting one that just happened to be playing sport. And then I guess as I was moving through, um, of course I, I um, respect newsbreakers, um, but Martin Flanagan um, for his writing and storytelling definitely stands out for me. Um, I love how um, flexible and incredibly dexterous Jared Waitley can be on any medium and seemingly on any topic. Does that yes. man ever sleep? Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how he does it, but, you know, if we needed to drug test for <laughs> broadcasters, um, he must be on some really good Chocolate. peptides. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and also, I guess, when I think back, because I'm so fond, even though initially I just hated it but you know being taken out I have really I can smell Princess Park when mm. I was a kid and when dad couldn't find someone to look after me you know I can smell that sort of cold concrete um, and I loved it you know I fell in love with it um, but and the voices for me there clearly dad and I'm totally biased so you know um, as a call um, um, but the other one is David Parkin mm. and you know he became a really special person in my life that I would also cite as someone that drew me in. Dad um, for all the reasons we've described would you know, need to take me to things um, and so he'd take me to these Carlton dinners when I just 
I was bored out of my brains, you know, but I remember the night that he introduced me to David Parkin and, and he was the coach of, you know, the, the club and David took an interest in me and, I, and he wrote me a letter and um, we, as sort of daggy as it sounds like, we became essentially pen pals. I have a box of letters still from David Parkin. He just wrote to me all the time. I think, you know, he's got an interesting sort of family background as well. I think he recognised something in us um, that, you know, spoke to him and he somehow found um, time to sit down and handwrite these letters that, you know, if I reviewed them now I'd probably get, you know, more emotional, but Mm. they're sitting at home. um, And he was a very special figure for me and who drew me in and I suppose showed me that it was possible that someone like me that didn't know how to sit down and talk stats with him or history or whatever um, was worth having a conversation with. So, and I still love listening to David on a Friday night. He invents words all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, and and he's passionate. You know, he he talks to everyone, um, the footy head, but also just someone that's interested in, in life. I think it's fair to say, and I think most of you would agree, the thing that makes you two quite extraordinary, you mentioned Jared Waitley and I'd put him in this category too, is you're not about personality you are about the sports you are about the journalistic side of it and we don't get to, you know of course you put your own flavor to things but you're not about uh, ego that's what it feels like um, so maybe what what's the bad side of sports journalism uh, or how not to do it I guess <laughs> without, <laughs> without naming names you don't have to name names oh dear um, well Look, I, I think, as, I, as and there are probably lots of people in this room who could identify with this, as, uh, as I get older, um, I think I actually become, if not less critical, I, I certainly become more aware of the good qualities in, in what people do. Um, and, and that's, I think, happened without an act of will on my part. Um, but I uh, probably become less secure in my own view of the world and a bit more recognising of the possibilities that uh, occasionally others are right and, uh, <laughs> um, and that, you know, that there might be people out there who, who know more about things than I do and uh, um, it, it sort of, when I think that way, it terrifies me as to how I did once view the world because there is that certainty of the young, I think, that I was certainly... Um, capable of exercising or, or guilty of, to put it another way. Um, so I see, you know, even in the, even even in some of the, what I'd find the less appealing forms of journalism, uh, I still see good quality um, in many ways. And so I won't sit here and um, diminish out of hand the work of individuals or even sections of the media, even though there are sections of the media that I wouldn't really want to work in or, or forms of the work that uh, wouldn't be how I would ever go about it. But um, nevertheless, it is, I mean, it is now such a big industry. Mm. So much has changed in, in that sense. What with, um, you know, a television station on pay that covers football constantly and um, <coughs> a radio station that does sport 24 hours a day. I think they go all night, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> it, uh, it, there is just so much being churned out and it actually demands so much of people who work in the industry and in, in lots of ways I'm grateful that um, I was of my time and that um, you know that my career is much closer to its end than it is to its beginning because um, it's a damn competitive business now and uh, enormously challenging I think for anyone to hold their own in. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I think all, what I'd say is just that um, the challenge for me, and I've, you know, Dad and I have talked about it. We we have different challenges, um, and have had different challenges. Um, that matter of, um, you know, Dad talks about self um, confidence, I guess, and, and security. It's it's one thing, I guess, and we've yeah we've debriefed on this to be um, a man. Um, 
talking about footy, AFL, um, it's a different thing to be a man who has played footy and talking mm. AFL mm. and there are lots of ex-players that talk footy and they just come from this place, I guess, of knowing it in a way that, you know, Dad can't, um, that I can't, but I guess what you've got to try and um, find in in times where you might doubt then, well, what are we worth? Well, an opinion that doesn't come from that position is also valid. Um, there's another layer when you're not um, a man. Um, but I guess what I've tried to do when, you know, in times sort of feeling, well, what would my view or voice count at all, is just to say, well, if, if people don't like it, they don't have to read it, they don't have to listen. If they don't value it, they don't have to do that either. And to just sort of chip away and trust your gut about the stories that you think mean something. And if a few people think that as well, well, that's that's a good thing. Because it is, there is, for, for all the um, broadcasters and commentators on, if we're just narrowing it down to AFL, it still is a fairly, uh, I think it's a, like the culture is fairly mono, I would say, still. Um, and so it is, there are challenges when you don't fit um, in that mm. um, box. Well, we're here at the Wheeler Centre and it's interesting. It's like saying that just because you don't write books, you have no authority at all to comment on the content of them mm. or the worth of them. And I think that um, that's a ridiculous argument. And it's so good to see uh, forerunners like yourself in the media. And it just, I can only imagine that it's inspiring a lot of young women as well. Um, there have been great changes or moves towards great changes there might be the, the there's the league of the in 2017 with yep. the female players and so <laughs> forth there's a huge passion for females in football whether it's at the executive level do you think there's uh, enough being done um i think the change within the afl itself has been way too slow yep. um it really disappoints me and it it frustrates me because i don't really understand why um you know, I go through periods where I think if I write another story about, you know, the the lack of females represented at board level, at executive level, at the AFL, um, I'll go mad. Mm. But then I think, well, you've got to keep writing it because if you don't, you know, who will kind of thing, um, I've given up. At, you know, someone once did sort of say, oh, don't get pigeonholed in that area, just a bit of advice. And I thought, I, I just listened at the time and then afterwards thought, well, actually, I don't consider that being pigeonholed. I just consider it writing about something that interests me. So um, I didn't take much notice of that. Um, I believe that Gillan McLaughlin, who took over on the 5th of June last year, um, wants to change the face of the AFL hierarchy. I expected there would be more change by now. And just this year, we've seen the resignation of another female executive at the AFL. I don't know what it is, but it seems that, you know, you can be a man on the AFL executive and be sent off with a gold watch after decades of service. And yet the women that have been appointed in that setting, um, I think, on average, probably stay there for two years. Now, um, why that is, there are probably numerous factors and I'm not saying that it's all sinister, but um, what disappoints me as someone that watches and someone that cares is that if you only have one woman on anything, on a committee, on an executive, on a board, um, you just are at risk because the moment that woman is no longer there for whatever reason, well, suddenly you have an undiverse board. And the same would apply if it was an all-female board and there's one man, you know. So this frustrates me. Um, but I am so excited about the, the Women's Football League and I know 
hand on heart that the AFL absolutely gets this, that Gillan McLaughlin could not be more supportive of it. The penny dropped this year only, and that's mm. that's the truth, even though it's been um, building for many years now, but it only dropped for them this year after the first ever free-to-air broadcast of the women's game Melbourne and the Bulldogs played before the male teams played. And more people watched that game on Channel 7, and admittedly it was free to air, but more people watched that game than watched the Diamonds win the World Cup, the Netball World Cup. Um, it, the ratings blew the socks off Channel 7, and for the first time, you know, in a debrief kind of scenario, I sat down and had the head of sport say to me, whoa, what about those women, you know, and he was just beside himself, like wrapped. Um, and and there's no doubt, it's just a fact of all of our lives, numbers talk. They were stoked with the ratings. The AFL was stoked. And I think what that says to us is that people love footy. So whether it's women, kids, men, whatever, um, put it on and people will watch. Um, and, and I guess if I can just go back slightly um, on the whole thing about why you love sport. Um, for me too, I haven't covered much women's sport apart from the Olympics, but this opportunity to cover women playing AFL really, really excites me. I don't want to play myself because I'm a scaredy cat. I've never liked contact <laughs> sport personally much better in the pool. But, um, but this seeing women do what they do and and any sport you know seeing Anna Mears win gold in London mm -hmm. and just that power and the training it inspires me um you know in a way that I can admire men playing sport but I can't be them but I can look at you know a woman even riding a bike and I can't ride a bike but I can look at her mm -hmm. and sort of see something that I don't see so that really inspires me from from a pure sport point of view any female commentator at mm. all, uh, no matter across the grid, will get criticism in a way online than no male will ever get. Yep. And I read an article once where uh, I think early on in your career you were looking online at forums and that is a black hole and a dark hole to get into. You gave Sam some advice uh, sort of saying don't look at that, you know. what? <laughs> well, that's. Um, I think it's probably the reality of performance whatever you do in a sense and you hear a lot of sports people saying I, I don't read it and um, mm. they're not always quite as good as their word but uh, well it's human isn't it I think and if you if you're in a situation where you know there's going to be some criticism around it it's it's difficult to deal with and it doesn't matter how experienced you are um, how many times you've subjected yourself to to you know that unpleasant experience uh it's never fun and it can affect your confidence yeah. and and the fact is that whether you're broadcasting or writing or or whatever else gee, the room suddenly come to light that's quite amazing <laughs> um uh you know confidence is is a precious commodity yeah. and um in broadcasting certainly it it, it is and uh it's not a good thing to be, um, you know, reading of the very low opinion that people have of your last performance. So, uh, yeah, my advice to Sam was, particularly with all this, you know, stuff through social media, just avoid it. Don't avoid social media necessarily, but no. don't, don't go trawling around looking to see what uh, people said about you. The good stuff can um, put bad ideas into your head and the bad stuff... Probably even worse. Can we pull out the dad card for a second? Um, <laughs> last year, I think it was, uh, Mick Malthouse was very yes. mean to you. And y your reaction, uh, how did you feel as a dad? Oh, well, I was watching it th that night. And, uh, yeah, I, did, I, I felt angry as I watched it. Just feeling, you know, this is a guy who's been coaching for a long time. And um, Sam was asking... She asked, just asked a couple of reasonable mm. questions and uh, got these, I don't know, abrasive answers that, um, and of course, when you're watching it on TV, as a parent, you feel protective and uh, maybe too much so, but, uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't feel 
very pleased about it. Probably made the mistake the next day of uh, expressing that on the air without... Yes. <laughs> Big <laughs> mistake, as Julia Roberts said. Uh, <laughs> but I've listened back to it. I think it's quite reasoned. You know, you're not, you know, uh, ranting and raving. You're speaking the voice of a reasoned... Well, I was working with comedy. Caro and... Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so as we convened around the, the round table just outside our box before we went in to go to air, um, the subject came up. She asked me what I thought and I told her the truth. <laughs> and uh, so with that in her mind, there's no way she wasn't going to raise it once we were on the air. <laughs> yeah, and I could hardly give her a different <laughs> version when that happened because if I had, she would have been all over that. And, uh, <laughs> She would have got the truth out of me somehow because she's pretty good at that. Well, I think Cameron Ling's mum or dad would have been yelling at the TV too. He was, she, he was, he's been a bit mean over the... It was the same night. And the same I, night, yeah. Yeah, for what it's worth. You know, I walked out of that press conference feeling that all that, all that Mick had done was do what he did sometimes and I didn't take it personally. Um, I didn't think it was any different to how he might speak to um, another journalist you know, the same night he'd berated Cameron Ling. Um, so I didn't take it personally. And so I, Dad is entitled to say whatever he wants, um, whenever he wants, clearly. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, and I said to him, I mean, I didn't, we didn't talk before he said what he said on the radio the next day. But um, afterwards I just said I was fine with that. Mm. I don't respect the behaviour. That's the point. I didn't... I didn't respect Mick Malthouse's behaviour, but that's not my problem. No, and it came All I was across, doing was my job. Yeah, yeah, it came across it was his problem, certainly not yeah. yours. So, yeah. What are you two like at the footy? Do you, are you screamers? Are you quiet <laughs> seethers? How, how do you sort of We've go? hardly ever been to the footy together, really. Well, I mean, we've it's been true. to a few games, but um, not very many because in all the years um, that I suppose I was... However, unconsciously uh, inculcating Sam in footy, uh, I was going off to work and uh, she was going off to, to watch at that early stage. Um, I remember actually as far back as 91 going out to the grand final year, it was at Waverley. And um, um, I was working and she went with a school friend and the school friend's father and maybe a sister and... Uh, I remember Sam coming up to the box. This has got nothing to do with your question. <laughs> Not Elizabeth. so far. <laughs> coming up to the box with her face painted in West Coast Eagles blue, oh, blue and gold. No. <laughs> um, just so, for a day. Yeah. But um, yeah, so she was, you know, she was going off and doing her own thing. Occasionally we went to games. I do remember we went to that game of the century between Carlton and Essendon in 2000 when the Bombers were unbeaten and it was what round 20 or something and uh, and Carlton had won 13 in a row although tripped up the previous week and got done by Terry Wallace's Bulldogs when uh, Wallace had sort of shown us flooding in its uh, in its early incarnation mm. but um, I actually I found it a bit strange going along and watching with Sam because I I don't get to go to many games either, but I was sort of a wound-up Carlton supporter that night and I wanted to yell and <laughs> swear and abuse and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And uh, I felt quite inhibited. I thought, wow. she'll be wondering what this father's turned into <laughs> if, uh, if he starts to reveal his true self on the, that very rare occasion of going to a game without being restricted by the constraints of broadcasting. <laughs> and, and you, Sam, with or without your dad, are you... A bit of a yeller or do you hold it in? No, I'm a quiet observer. Yeah. So there are moments that kind of get me yelling and they can now, I mean, I'm as much as the whole Carlton thing was what drew me in, um, I, I can yell for anyone now. Um, I follow all sorts of people for all sorts of different reasons across the competition, um, usually when they've been generous in an interview so I you know like really follow their stories and I'm total you know I get totally hooked on things and often you know dad and I go swimming um, when we can on Tuesdays and we have a breakfast afterwards and always a good chat and um, yeah we can be talking about someone I won't name the name but you know that I've interviewed and did a really good piece or whatever and he might just say but don't you know that doesn't mean that rah, 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 you know don't get hooked in um, <laughs> 
and um and so yeah i i um i can sort of barrack but i guess one thing about covering it year after year after year as a as a journal is that you sort of detach well i detach a bit from that live and die kind of factor that makes football tick actually mm. you know that real fan madness in a good way um you know i think you have to if you're going to cover it um in a way that you know a journalist should you need to kind of be able to just sit back a little bit and not be completely um one-eyed so i i can i will go to any match of football and find something in it and love it i would love to go to more games with dad and sort of dream about that one day you know with a couple of thermoses and nice blanket something like that um and um but yeah i i'm a fairly contained observer and i do like to listen to the commentary yeah yeah I had a soft spot to, uh, for Carlton until I went to Princess Park and uh, Carlton won by 102 points against Hawthorne and strangers were carrying me on their shoulder in my, all my Hawthorne gear. So, wow. Yeah, just carrying me. Go, ah. So, yeah, no. You don't look old enough to go back to the times when Carlton beat Hawthorne by 102 <laughs> points. <Alicia. laughs> oh, those were the days. Oh. <laughs> sure were. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And so, just finally, before we put it to you to ask questions, um, a player each from you, who, who, who you're watching, who you're loving at the moment? Oh. I mean, um, there must be so many. Yeah, mm. let me think. You go first, Sam. Okay, yep. Well, I've got two on my mind. Um, they're both in the West and they're both still clearly um, in contention. Um, Nat Fife. Um, who I wrote about for Men's Health magazine, actually, which I never thought I would say, but um, they sent me off on this mission and I was told in before I met Nat that he could be a little bit aloof and um, he might be a difficult interview subject, which always makes me really motivated to make it a really good interview. So I flew off to Perth that day. Um, it was sort of a bells and whistles kind of shoot. Um, but before that shoot, and they wanted to sort of put us in this, you know, lounge area. And I just thought, no, let's take us away somewhere. And I took us to this really dodgy sort of kitchen and put two chairs together. I really believe in the setting. And I thought, if he's aloof, I need to really just make it focused and, you know, um, no distractions. And we had this, like, it was a great chat. You know, he began by saying, I don't want to talk too much about my rituals and blah, blah, blah. And I knew they were a bit personal because he was been working with Brett Kirk, um, yoga, meditation, etc. But once we got going, like, he just, he really opened up and it was one of my favourite conversations I've had with a footballer. Um, so Nat Fife, I'm really following, and the other one is Nick Nat Nui, mm. um, who I spoke to when I was in Perth two weeks ago. Uh, he lost his mum, um, you know, a month ago, five weeks ago, and um, the only reason I think he agreed to speak to me in Perth a week ago is because he'd agreed to speak to me the week that his mother eventually passed away. So we had to pull the pin on this interview. Now I would never given the change of circumstances you just accept that no problem at all but it was sort of put to me that Nick felt bad that he'd cancelled this interview and so he agreed to speak to me um, in Perth um, and again um, we had about 45 minutes in a room and I just it, the way that this guy kind of shared um, yeah I just it blew me away and in the end it was one of those ones where you sort of you stop your tape and think what do I do with that now um but anyway wrote a story on that last week and I just I know he's playing for his mum um I know what you know the kind of emotion that he's feeling and that whole feeling that you need to believe that the spirit never leaves when someone dies um and so I'm really really barracking for him this um, final series, both of them, but um, yeah, Nick Natanui. Me too, until they play Hawthorne, yes. <laughs> great player, great player. Yeah, I suppose um, a couple of types of player come to mind. I, I love um, I love the sort of the, 
the gallant player who mightn't play at a successful club and, you know, gives an entire career that in the end goes unfulfilled at that team level. And um, there's, there's something about that experience which I find quite moving in, um, in sport and in, in football. You know, a, a game that physically is very demanding, very taxing. And um, so I look at Bob Murphy, who, I, you know, I gather was here and some of you would have heard uh, earlier in the year. Um, I think two of a player like Lenny Hayes, who was broadcasting in a box next door at the weekend and, you know, who, who again, um, just depicted that quality so, so beautifully. And um, you think about that drawn grand final and, you know, the last quarter he played and... Um, just, you know, being so agonisingly close and yet it didn't ever happen and there's something sort of the Greek tragedy or whatever about it. Um, so th those types of players appeal to something within me. Uh, as for just going along and watching people perform, I, I, I think I could still say that um, if um, he was going to produce his best on any given weekend, uh, Buddy Franklin would be the player that I would go along to watch because uh, just to see so much swagger and, you know, sort of all of that and where it comes from and what the psychology of it all is, who knows? And it's fascinating to uh, consider all of that through the, the current prism. But, uh, boy, what a what an athlete. And uh, I don't think there's any... For, for all the... Ablett Seniors and Wayne Careys and so on. Um, and there's a bit of both of them in Buddy. But uh, there's nobody that um, ever, in my experience, you'd have gone to a game and sort of identified more rapidly than you would Buddy yeah. on the field on his good days. He just has had it all and I hope there are some good ones lie ahead. And I think Cyril Rioli is another one. I mean, so many of the Indigenous players that just so instinctive and uh, and make the game so thrilling. I agree with that one. Yeah. Uh, a couple of quick questions uh, to the audience. Yeah, over there. Uh, thank you. As a Frio follower, heave ho and uh, going out <laughs> five, we could talk about footy for days, but I want to ask you how different is it, what sort of challenge is it to cover an Olympics and a sport that you may not be fully versed in? What's that like? Where do we start? You go first. I'll go first. Yeah, well, I, I, I uh, mainly did track and field, which, having been given the opportunity to, to do it, um, I tried to um, absorb myself in it as much as I could, although it's not always easily done through a year when you're covering football in winter and cricket in summer and, and all of that. But um, there is that need. I mean, once upon a time, probably when I was growing up, um, the Olympics on TV were covered by a conglomerate of the three or four networks of the time uh, who would share the coverage. And the athletics would be broadcast by Bill Collins from Channel 7 and 3DB because he could call a race. And so in those days, you know, there was little care given to the fact that it actually helped <laughs> If you, if you knew something about the sport. And uh, so it used to be joked that, you know, Bill would talk about someone coming through on the inside, sc <laughs> scraping paint off the fence sort of thing, <laughs> coming through on the rails. And uh, standards have, have, have risen. And actually, uh, that um, created a challenge in my area because Bruce McAvaney drove that raising of the standard like nobody else. I mean, his attention to the detail of track and field was extraordinary. So as much as I love doing it, it was, a, it was quite an ordeal uh, every, say, two years with the Commonwealth Games cycle in there as well. But uh, thrilling, nevertheless, because the athletics, you know, in a main stadium at the Olympics, you walk in there on the first morning and you just see it all laid out. And uh, if you've never done it, try and get to one. And it, it, there is no feeling quite like it in, in sport, I think it's uh, reasonable to say. Mm. Yep, different experience for me because I've not, you know, called foreign sports. Um, Dad also called the basketball, I think, in Seoul. Is I that did. right? Mm. Yep. So I had to get his head around that. My <laughs> height came into play. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, 
and the ability to slam dunk. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when you're writing for a newspaper, you have that relative luxury of just trying to identify the best stories um, who are the great metal hopes, you know. So for cycling for me, I was like, you know, Cadell Evans, Anna Mears and, you know, work on them as two people that you really need to get to know in terms of their history and character, then try to make, um, you know, professional contact with them and then build that so it's quite a different experience and I think it would be much harder to be calling broadcasting a foreign sport um, to write about it you can find ways and if in doubt which um, comes up a lot you know especially when you know in Beijing you're suddenly off covering the mountain bike and you think oh my god I've actually never covered mountain bike in my life um, you can you can sort of say to yourself, just even if just for a pep up, um, most people that are reading this piece probably will never have read anything about mountain bikes either. So just kind of go with a curious mind, be as well researched as you can, and um, then cross your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> cross check facts. Another question? Uh, just wherever the. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, 17th position maybe last year next year would be a reasonable objective it's going to be a long haul I've, that, that list has run down unbelievably badly and I, I, I don't mean to sound too pained because I'm used to it I'm, um, and I enjoyed all the good years but uh, um, boy oh boy I mean it's, it's quite extraordinary that I, an entity within this sporting competition could have been so poorly run and it raises all sorts of interesting questions I think about institutions and um, and the modes of administration and uh, I have to say as much as I you know I I sort of quite like him in a way I all feel a fondness for him um, but John Elliott um, for you know, the good that he sought to do, I think, you know, almost imposed a, a long time curse on Carlton because um, just to run something where such a small coterie of, of one a lot of the time um, dictated terms and, um, and where rules got in your way, you just broke them and, and that sort of thing. It, um, it, all the flaws are, are now on display in that Carlton is only just starting to show signs of realising 20 years after some other clubs did uh, that you just can't function that way in the modern era. So, um, you know, sometimes out of great empires come these incredible collapses and probably the same happened to Melbourne you know they were the last great amateur era team and there were a lot of amateurs who played for Melbourne in that uh, in that wonderful era of the fixed 50s and into the early 60s and uh, Carlton were the sort of the you know maybe the great casualty the great empire collapse of the semi-professional era and uh, they're only now realizing that uh, things have moved on and th they have to move too and there's still a lot of catch-up time. Former Carlton players excelling everywhere else, though. <laughs> well, exactly. We had a fantastic weekend. And uh, <laughs> how, many, how many stakes can one heart have driven through it? <laughs> sorry. Uh, and one final question, uh, wherever that... Sorry. Oh, uh, this is a question that, uh, that involves inspiration. I was at the MCG where they had the State of Origin and they did a tribute to Ron Clark. And I turned to that young girl next to me and said, do you, do you know who Ron Clark is? And, and she didn't, which was fair enough. In your journalistic um, travels and covering Olympics, it, could, is there a moment or anything that's occurred at the Olympics that as a journalist you'd, you might like to bottle that up and send out to young Australians as an inspirational moment for them? Oh, well, at Olympics you... you you see a few of them. Um, Ron Clark, I guess, belongs in that category of, um, you know, at an even grander level in a sense of um, Lenny Hayes and Bob Murphy in a way, doesn't he? As this man who, who dominated his sport, um, who just lacked that one 
element to be the complete package, and that was the ability to outkick everybody else if they managed to stay with him for the first 24 laps of 25 of a, of a 10,000 metre event. Um, I suppose a couple of events in track and field come to mind. I, I do remember the first Olympics I did uh, was Los Angeles in 84, and uh, I mean, this is long forgotten, but at the Brisbane Commonwealth Games in 82, the 400 metres pitted Australia's Rick Mitchell, who was now an Olympic silver medalist, against a Canadian, a, a Jamaican named Bert Cameron. And uh, Cameron beat Mitchell, and he was a, a magnificent cut of a man. And the next year, he won the inaugural World Championship event in Helsinki, uh, and then went to LA for the Olympics as... Um, you know, sort of a, with a chair of favouritism to do it again. And in his semi-final, he seemed to do a... It was like he did a hamstring or just got a twinge at about the 200 metre point. He hopped into the air, clutched the back of his thigh and, you know, he was out of the race to all intents and purposes. And then with the field about 15 metres in front of him, he just started... He, he gave it another go. And he came storming home in the home straight and uh, the first four went into the final, the Olympic final, and a South Australian named Bruce Frain, who was a fine Australian sprinter and, and 400 metre runner of his time, was in fourth position, hanging on, and he could obviously sense that someone was coming at him. And Bruce Frain was someone I really liked, you know, and admired as a, an athlete, and I was actually wanting Cameron to get there because he was, he was coming over the top. And the pity of it was that he actually edged Frayne out of fourth position, but then couldn't run in the final because of his injury. Oh. Uh, and because Frayne hadn't finished fourth, I don't think he got into the final either. So uh, Cameron was in, and so I think they might have had a field of seven in the, in the uh, final. So that was, uh, that was pretty amazing. The other one that probably comes to mind is um, Andy Lloyd, in Auckland in 1990, and um, um, I'm not sure how many people would remember that, but in in the mid 1980s, around about 80, 86, I think he was in a terrible car accident coming home uh, from Canberra, where he'd been competing, to Sydney, and uh, his young wife, who was an athlete, was killed, and um, Andy was pretty badly knocked about as well. He was a passenger in the car and um, it took him a long time to get his career back on track. And he was also renowned as someone who didn't quite manage to put it together in the big events. He, he was one of those sports people who, you know, got the reputation of not being a big time performer. And, uh, and he went to Auckland and it was his last chance really. I remember hearing someone say before we went in that day, if he doesn't perform today, he'll never be chosen again. And he was in the 5,000 metres. And um, it was the most incredible race in which uh, the, the Olympic champion, John Ngugi from Kenya, fell early on and, um, and, and picked himself up. And from about 20 or 30 metres behind, he just, it was as though he had a moment of madness and he sprinted and he ran up to the field and then he didn't stop and he kept going and put himself sort of about 30 metres in front. And there's still... 4,000 metres of the 5,000 to go. And he led by 20 or 30 metres until the bell lap. And it was the most stunning performance. And then they've gone into the last lap and Lloyd was in this group who were 20 or 30 metres back. And, and suddenly I had this moment, almost like a premonition, where I thought, Lloyd, I've seen him at Olympic Park in lesser events. He can really finish. And this guy is going to is starting to struggle a bit. And I remember I started to say Lloyd could win this. And I didn't dare say it because it seemed so <coughs> preposterous in that moment. And from about the 200 metre point, Lloyd took off. He broke away from the pack he was with and into the home straight. And he uttered the famous words later when he was asked about it. Um, what were you feeling when you came into the home straight? And he said... I thought, bugger the silver, I'm going for the gold. <laughs> <laughs> and he just, he was coming home and it was this amazing finish with this incredibly brave champion Kenyan athlete hanging on and Lloyd mowing him down and Lloyd got him in about the second last stride and won it. And, you know, in the wake of a, a terrible 
personal tragedy, um, to win like that was an incredibly uh, fulfilling moment for him. And I think everyone who ever saw that would uh, would remember it. It was just the most amazing athletics event I, I ever saw. I sure, I'm sure Long you Long story, sorry. I no, hope. it's great. The thing is you could listen to these two speak forever, but unfortunately we can't. And I'm sure you'd agree with me. These two should write a book, don't you think? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Can I just say thank you, thank you very much for that, yes, and uh, and thank thanks you. for coming. It's, it's yeah. humbling that people would uh, be interested to come along and yeah. have a listen He's to us. They sound surprised. Thank you. A big round of applause, Sam yeah. Wayne and Tim Wayne. Yeah. Thank you.